get the okay. presentation started. Okay, thanks, Phil. Well, we're fortunate to have Mr. Will Coop on the call this evening to introduce our guest speaker. Will is the coordinator of the BC Tap Water Alliance, and he worked closely with Paul Hundle and Elaine on the campaign to protect our watersheds. So, Will, you want to um, start your introduction? Thanks, Victoria. Um, I like to say, you know, it was it was a celebration for Elaine that got this thing going, and and so hats off for doing that. Um, I should just say before I introduce uh, Paul, you, you can see him there on on the right hand side. That's a picture that the North Shore News took of the both of us as a kind of uh, celebration of of our accomplishments. I forget when this was taken, but probably about ten years after the fact, after nineteen ninety nine. Anyways, this was the the um, the engagement, the, the 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 let's let's say the battle we had with the Greater Vancouver Water District was probably the biggest and prolonged um, kind of thing that ever happened in in the history of the water district, and it went on for almost ten years. So, anyways, uh, I met Paul back in late nineteen ninety one in December, and we've been friends ever since. At that time, he was the president of SPEC, the Society Promoting Environmental Conservation. And uh, I remember uh, when I first came to the meetings at the Water District, and uh, I, I wasn't a speaker, a uh, public speaker at all. I was very, very nervous. But I remember him. He was, he, was, he was a great speaker. And he always wore a pinstripe expensive suit. And uh, as you, you, I think that's the same thing that you see in that picture there. <laughs> and so, so we were kind of opposites in that way. I was casual, and he wasn't very casual. And of course, he's well trained as a lawyer, and and um, um, Paul uh, Paul at that time, prior to the to his engagement with this history, he was involved in 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 two victorious uh, um, battles, one at Cypress Bowl and one in the Lower Seymour Conservation Reserve, where they wanted to put in housing, and Paul. I found this document that actually um, protected the area. So uh, Paul's been very skillful in what he's done. And um, I just want to say that uh, I mentioned to Victoria, I did a, um, a video uh, on, on, on the achievements of winning the Greater Vancouver Watersheds. This is, this is an event that was held on November 10th, 1999. And both Paul and I made a presentation to the all the mayors. And that video is available online. So you can see Paul's summary and my summary at that time. So um, anyways, I'll, I'll leave it over to Paul right now. Thank you. So how many people are here today? And I'm sure that there's a high level of experience, but I will just go kind of back to basics. And because I know this meeting is taped and people might be watching who don't have the same level of experience we have with the natural world. And so I'm going to start off by defining a watershed. And we're talking about logging in the watershed. And I think the, it really is important to go back to basics to really understand this. Because I think when it comes down to it, I, kids can understand how wrong it is to log in a watershed. I learned that once you explain it, they get it. So in defining what a watershed it is, it's that territory that sheds water into a water course. So the Capilano watershed is that territory, that that landscape that uh, drains water into the Capilano River. Seymour watershed is the land base that drains water into the Seymour River. Now for us, we have the ability to protect the whole watershed for the Seymour Valley, for the Coquitlam Valley, and Capilano Valley because they're relatively contained in size. We have lots of rain, so the production of water is high. We have old growth forests that act as filters, which when that rain lands, it by the time it gets into the river system, it's well filtered and it's probably some of the cleanest water on earth. And it's easy to forget that, that we are so lucky. And the best way to understand why it's so different is if you think of the Mississippi watershed, think of the Mississippi watershed covers one third of the United States. People who live on flatlands or live in, in uh, areas with large water systems 
not contained. They have no chance of protecting the surface water. That surface water runs all the, runs through all sorts of contaminated land. Up in the interior, the water goes through uh, rangeland where cattle is uh, is um, be grazing. So there's all sorts of contamination that would normally happen in a watershed as the water drains into the catchment. And we are blessed by the fact that when a uh, hundred over a hundred years ago, um, it was recognized that we had the ability because we, as colonists who came here and the natives, uh, the indigenous people took such care, good care of the Kapa'o, the Seymour and the Coquitlam watershed, you had a forest that was thousand years old and um, intact forest producing the finest quality water. Well, in the beginning of the 1900s, as Vancouver started to grow, there was a lot of logging that took place to the Capilano. And the Capilano had already been set up as being the water supply for Vancouver, the, for the town of Vancouver. And there was complaints in the early 1900s, there's newspaper articles of heated debates over about trying to stop the logging because it was fouling the water that people were relying on. And there was a Attempts, you know, there was discussion about buying the rights, but what had happened is the rights had been alienated early at, for the Capilano drainage, uh, much of it, and uh, the the log, the people who own those rights held out for way too much money. I went through a lot of newspaper articles from the time, and you know, at first they could have got it for a reasonable price. They didn't jump on it quick enough, and then the price went up so high that people were appalled and they were trying to get the government to buy it and all sorts of uh, debates happened as the water got worse and worse and worse as the Capilano Timber Company logged away at the Capilano watershed. Then came along this gentleman by the name of Ernest Cleveland uh, who had uh, had was well respected uh, in the early uh, 1900s in the community um, and he uh, had a vision of protecting the watersheds. And through his connections and through his uh, involvement with government, uh, he managed to pull together uh, the Greater Vancouver Water District, and he became its first water commissioner. And um, I was going to share my screen and see if I can show you uh, my image of him, but I'm not sure if it's going to work. Um, can you see my... Yes. Yes. Okay, but you're only seeing a the, the a small image, aren't you? Um, I just have to start the PowerPoint. Uh, if anybody, I'm not great at this, so. Uh, if should be able to if you go over to slideshow. Perfect. Right. And then set up from beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Just hit function five. Yeah. Uh -oh. There we go. There you can see it. So this is Ernest Cleveland, and in. What he did in um, the, in, by 1927, um, he had organized the Greater Vancouver Water District. And at that point, he, um, sorry, I'm just going to turn this off because it really doesn't uh, work for me right now. I'm just going to end the show. Um, but I do love the fact that this man um, put so much effort into creating a protected system of watersheds by the way, can you see me now, or is it? Um, are we no. back to what it should be? We can see you. Slide. Okay. Are you? Can you see a slide? Yeah, but not the slideshow. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I didn't mean for that. I'm going to hit stop share. There so you go. Back to here. <laughs> anyway, here. um, what he did was he he I believe he was a conservationist. I mean, technically, he was there to protect the water, but uh, he was protecting the old growth as well. And he recognized that as the old growth, leaving the old growth intact was the best way to provide the highest quality water uh, to, to uh, Vancouver residents now and in the future. And it served, it was a brilliant uh, vision of uh, Ernest Cleveland to set up that water um, system covering the three uh, drainages of Capilano, Coquitlam, and Seymour. Capilano had already been heavily impacted, but Seymour had not. And he set up the intake far enough up the river so it was not impacted by um, 
colonial logging that had taken place up until then. And, and Coquitlam was well protected. It was the best protected of them. So that was his vision in 1927. And Will found a quote from him later, I believe it was in the 40s, where he said, they'll log that watershed over my dead body. And unfortunately, that's pretty well what happened, because after he died, the, the, the industry started working on uh, accessing the timber supply in the watershed. Um, he died in January, January 8th, 1952. And it wasn't long after that, the C.D. Schultz and Company started to write reports strongly recommending that we cut the decadent old forest, the decadent and diseased old trees and replace them with young and thrifty trees. That became the mantra. Replace these old decadent trees with young thrifty trees to have the highest quality water. And that's what they pushed for. And um, then what happened was when they were cleaning, uh, when they were clearing the, the catchment area for the Seymour, they hired a company that would do that clearing. And then by the time they finished clearing what would become the Seymour Reservoir, they didn't stop. They said, well, if we have some diseased trees over here. We, should, yeah. we really should start cut, trying to cut those. And in 1961, they they authorized some smaller cuts in areas that were, um, uh, which they could get away with because they, they probably did have some disease. They weren't the big trees. They were the smaller trees. So people who were um, still remembered that this was supposed to be high, you know, protected, um, didn't say anything at that time. Now, I should also say that my family grew up here. My grandfather moved here in 1906. Uh, my dad was raised here, went to McGill High School and uh, got his engineering degree in University of Washington. The stories I have from the family are that we've always had clean drinking water. We've had the best drinking water. And as some of you have already mentioned in the earlier, that changed. And that changed after the logging. Now, it didn't happen right away. What had happened initially, they were logging in very small uh, areas where they were able to justify it. Um, but in the background, there was a fellow by the name of Ray Williston, who was the uh, Minister of Forest Lands and Water Resources. And he was very much pro-timber, pro-logging industry. And he was uh, um, actively working to undo the legacy of Ernest Cleveland. I mentioned before the, the meeting started that the, this image behind me has a, a small connection to the story, which is this, the giant trees you see behind me are from the Sequoia National Park, and they were directly saved by the actions of John Muir, who was the founder of the Sierra Club. And he started fighting to save these trees back in the 1870s, and by by the 1890s, uh, it was made into a state park, and eventually Teddy Roosevelt made it into a national park. Ernest Cleveland was our John Muir, and that he was helping, along with John Davidson and others, uh, who actively worked to protect lands. Ray Williston, when he ended up with the position of Minister of Lands, Forests, and uh, Water Resources, was the person who was committed to undoing a lot of that. There's one park, I, which I'm sure no one's really heard of, but Eric Hamburg Provincial Park. It was created in the 40s. It was a million hectares in size. Magnificent park, which covered the the, the Columbia River, uh, the forest throughout there, and, and it connected up to Jasper and Yoho and Banff National Park. It created a much larger protected area. Uh, Ray Williston worked to church, convert it into a 24,000 hectare park, you know, about 2% of its size. And the part that he's left was Hamburg Provincial Park is all alpine. Uh, but that's the kind of guy he was. And he created, he, he signed into a law an amending indenture. The original indenture, which was brought in by Cleveland in 1927, uh, created a system which didn't provide any incentive to log. It really discouraged any logging from taking place. It would have to be absolutely critical for the functioning of the water supply before a tree could be cut. The amending indenture turned, did the opposite. The amending indenture, which was passed in 19, 1967, which was signed into law in 1967, required logging. 
and required a certain amount number uh, amount of logging under a sustained yield program. So it forced the water district to log. And so that logging program started then and continued through the 70s. By the 80s, some of the worst logging took place where they were getting more into the steeper side hills where you're more likely to have landslides and those landslides started to happen. And so by the late 80s, every time you had a heavy rain, you started to notice brown water. We didn't notice that brown water in the 70s. We certainly noticed it by the late 80s. And then an event happened and it was, and I am gonna to try to, to share my, my screen here for a second. Um, so I'll go back to the uh, PowerPoint here. Now you can see the PowerPoint, I take it? Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You just need to um, go I'm to full screen. The slideshow, and I'll just go from the beginning. But uh, I'll now go through it. Zip through. This came out in 1990, and it was the, about the Jameson Creek uh, watershed. By the way, this is Ray Williston. A uh, book was written about it called Forest That's Power and Policy. We're and not yet, seeing. We're not we're seeing not the image. Seeing it. Oh, the next slide. Look at on the left. It, just, we're, it, it's just, it's not in full screen. Yeah, I see. You have to start the PowerPoint actual presentation before you share. Okay. Yeah. So I've stopped it, and then uh, mm -hmm. I started, and then hit share. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. Stop, stop sharing. Okay. I've stopped. I've stopped sharing. I should have. Uh, no, you're still sharing. Oh darn. Okay. And I, I see that map and that's in the way. So I've got to <laughs> close that off. And Yeah. Sorry, There's folks. a green bar at the top of your screen, is there not? That says. Thank you. Stop share. Click. There, there we go. Okay. okay. Well, yeah. anyway, those images. Uh, I've got an image which um, of the Jameson Creek land. That particular image wasn't of the Jameson Creek landslide, but there, there is another image, and uh, I'm going to try sharing it in a different way. Start and... the presentation, like crank, actually open the presentation and and start it in presentation mode. Like open up the PowerPoint. Um, I'm just going to show this. This is the Jameson Creek landslide oh. from an aerial. Can you? Now see you got it. it? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, and so this took place in November of 1990. Now you can see it starts in the clear cut, but right at the top of the clear cut, it goes all the way down and into here, and then narrows once it hits forest. Yeah, but uh, this was an exact. This landslide muddied our water for a month. It was the worst event. That was one with had had everybody in Vancouver talking, because when this came down, you couldn't hide the fact that there was the Seymour uh, uh, Reservoir had filled with mud. And um, when, at Western Canada Wilderness Committee sent in um, uh, uh, an area, a crew to, uh, sent in a plane to take a picture of the image of the Jameson Creek landslide. Curly Chittenden paid the cost of it. He's a He was a longtime supporter. Mm -hmm. Chittenden Meadows, um, is named after him, but he was a longtime supporter of the Western Canada Wilderness Community Conservation. He paid the cost to send in a flight to take aerial photography of what was going on because the public was not allowed in there to see it. The, the regional district was adamant about keeping the public out, and they didn't tell anybody that things like this were going on. Things like this were going on. This is a big example. But when it happened so bad, and then when the Western Canada Wilderness Committee had this opportunity to send in a flight and pay for the cost of for photographing what was going on, they th they they found this. And they put it into a newspaper, which was um, in my uh, presentation, but I don't need to show it. But essentially, it, uh, it, it woke up Vancouver. It woke up Vancouver to the fact that there's this logging going on that is causing landslides and all that brown water coming out of your, your tap is probably related to that. Of course, the GVRD tried to deny it. They'd been denying for years that there was any connection and they continued to play yeah. it down. Um, around that same time, just by uh, coincidence of timing, 
there was a study going on and at a public process with regard to uh, the um, whether how to manage our water supply system. And um, I'm now oh. going to I'm going to share it. Oh, you're uh, going to bed? <laughs> sorry. Uh, can anyone see? OK, I'm going to now share this image. The, the Greater Vancouver uh, Watershed Management Evaluation and Policy Review. This draft summary report came out in January 1991. We wanted to see the technical report behind it because Mark Waring had been telling us uh, about he, once we became involved and I was uh, involved with SPEC and when the Jameson Creek landslide happened, uh, SPEC and Western Canada Wilderness Committee were working together to try to do something about this because it became really obvious that now the public was aware and this battle that Mark Waring and Western Canada Wilderness Committee were fighting all alone for, for a few years before that was finally getting some traction because now people were really noticing. But at the same time, the Greater Vancouver came out, Regional District came out with this report, timely, January 1991, just you know, three months after the Jameson Creek landslide. So right when everybody's talking about, then they came up with this draft. We wanted to see the technical report behind it. They wouldn't let us see it. They didn't want to. We ended up having to advocate and push and lobbied Gordon Campbell, who was the chair of the GVRD, say, why are you keeping it a secret? Well, we finally got them to produce it. And in there, in the appendixes, there was there was information we could definitely use to support our cause, which raised serious questions about the appropriateness of the logging. And um, it wasn't too long after that I met Elaine, and I remember Elaine was very much our our scientist peer reviewer who went through the the reports and provided such helpful analysis and contrib contribution, and by the way, of letters on behalf of the Brook Mountain Naturalists to add to the dialogue, the science, that uh, challenging the science that was being presented that this logging was good for water quality. Um, and Will uh, was also involved at the time. I met him through the same process and he was uh, doing a lot of uh, research and his research was uh, incredibly helpful and he was writing letters to the GVRD and and started attending water committee meetings what had happened is I as a lawyer I realized that the place to bring about change is but through the board the GVWD board has the authority to stop this and so lobbying and protesting that that has its place Western Canada Wilderness can be have that covered but as a lawyer that's not the way I would fight it and that's not the way I did fight it. What I did is I went to the board, I applied for delegations, I had to go through the water committee first, followed all the rules, wore, put on my suit, and and lobbied them. I, I talked to them, I gave presentations on why I thought this was wrong. And in the course of it, Elaine started writing letters discussing the science and on behalf of the Burke Mountain Naturalists, doing the same thing. We weren't working together initially. We were just separate people who had the same concerns and were coming from different angles to provide the research. And Will started attending the water committee meetings and was helping, uh, you know, and bring light to the subject himself. And through the process, as we were sitting at the, all the water committee meetings together, and then we'd go to the board to make our presentation to the board. We certainly got to know each other. And at that time, there was also a process where each of the cut blocks needed to go to the board for approval. Prior to us becoming involved, there were rubber, they were rubber stamped. It was a consent agenda item. It was just something that was done. After we became involved, we started raising questions about each and every cut block. We did the best research we could into what the cut block involved, the type of forest there was there. What is the rationalization for this anyway? And and raising concerns about Jameson Creek and are we going to have another one of those? And so each one of those cut block proposals needed the approval of the board. And that gave us a chance to go to the board and, and question them. So between 1991 and I'm going to say to 1994, Elaine, uh, Will and myself were regularly appearing before attending almost every water committee meeting and every board meeting uh, to law, to advocate for the truth and for the conservation of these lands and to stop the watershed logging. Now it's interesting in the 
early in the process in 1991, the votes were against us. And, uh, you know, it, it went down party lines. To, you know, the Cope was always voting for us, Libby Davies, Harry Rankin, you know, and, and the, the um, uh, NPA voted against us, you know, George Puel and Gordon Campbell. And uh, there was other people who were very important in the process. Len Trombley, who was the mayor of uh, Port Coquitlam, was was an elder statesman within the GVRD board. He'd been in the board on the GVRD board since it was formed in the 1960s. And Jack Lokes was another person who went back there. And and um, they were voting against well, for logging, and they weren't supporting any of our motions in the early 1990s in 1991 and 1992. But after a couple of years, with our persistence, and they were reading our, our letters, and they were thinking about it. You know, Jack Jack Laos, I knew him, and he was an old school principal of mine. And I, from one to seven, he taught. He was my school principal. And, you know, he came up to me and said, you know, I, I've supported this for so long, but you know what? What you say actually is starting to make sense. And Len Trobley, who was, like I said, the elder statement, he went from being all for it because he was supporting the forest industry and the loggers. And he said that in 1991. He went to being all for it to being all against it. He completely turned around. George Puel, who was a person who was considered to be on you know, the right wing side of things and uh, with the MPA and for it, he was uh, initially voting for it. Over the over the years, he turned around. He started voting against it, and he he said specifically his let these letters that are coming to me are are in, are making sense. They were having an effect, and um, so by 1994, uh, they they were starting to seriously think of stopping the logging. Now there was one very important. Well, there was one cut block that went for approval. I call it cut block number 162 and 163 in the East Cap River uh, system, which was off its um, side drainage off Capilano. It was to it was a totally intact old growth forest before the logging commenced under the amending indenture. The tree, we actually got to go in there on a tour and we got, we lobbied for it and we got the opportunity to go in there. I saw the biggest cedar trees I'd, I've ever seen on the North Shore. There was one in particular, 14 feet wide, that absolutely blew me away. I was in tears when that tree was cut down. Um, but it was part of cut block 162, 163. That became our battleground. We were saying, this is really crazy. There's no justification for this. Why are you cutting this perfect stand of giant old growth, which is not diseased, not dead, and you could, there was a stream that ran through it and you, the rocks in the middle of the stream were covered in moss and the water trickled through and it was so pure you could just go down and drink it right there and it was running through this old growth forest. It was a magnificent stand and their rationale for cutting it was, well, we recognize that cedar stands are more stable and we want to convert the forest to cedar, uh, but hemball stands um, are are not what we want. And because this this forest is really old, we believe it's turning into a hemball stand, so we might as well cut it now. Now, it's not going to turn into a hemball stand for 100 years at least. But And more importantly, there are hemball stands in other places near in the watershed. Well, they're already hemball. They're already of this type of species which need to be converted according to their logic. It made no logical sense for them to cut the cedar stand because it was going to become hemlock balsam in a hundred years. So we might as well cut it down. There was no rationale for it. So there was quite a heated um, debate about this, approving these cut blocks. Someone came into that meeting though uh, for a delegation that surprised us. Jack Monroe, president of the IWA. He came in, he stabs down his fist and he made arguments for protecting the forest workers and all these environmentalists or just you know what radicals and he just it was just he made his usual Jack Monroe kind of pitch we're at the meeting where they were deciding whether to proceed with these cut blocks and in the end it passed 
the cut blocks got approved, but there was a bad feeling about it. It was a clearly divided vote. Those trees got cut down. They start, two of the blocks got cut down. We snuck in after. I probably shouldn't have said that. It's been, <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a, we, we uh, actually, we walked away from a tour. We went on a tour after, which was a pub watershed tour that would, and we walked away from to go into the stand to see what happened. One of the first things I noticed was when I went across that creek, which was running pristine, the rocks in the stream were, all the moss was gone. The banks were blown out. And this wasn't even a year old. And there was already that drain, that creek was trash. And I thought to myself, how can the experts who are supporting this not see that? They obviously see it. How could they not see that those blown stream banks would wash into the water supply? But they didn't. So we crossed the stream. We went and I, we found the biggest tree, the one that I'd seen on the original tour. Two people laid on the stump and their heads did not join. I didn't have a tape to measure it, but you know, it was 14 feet wide and it was almost solid to the core. And you know, how could they do that? How could they think that that's okay? But they they did. Now, what had happened after that? We got pictures out of those of those stumps. And the the politicians at that point really did want to stop it. Um and the staff responded by stopping it. They 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 agreed to not go any further and to have a review. And um, then the logging company sued because there was more of, there was a few more stands just like this, uh, not as big as that, that, that tree was the best, biggest in that whole drainage and the whole watershed, I believe in the whole North Shore. Um, but uh, there were other stands similar and not quite as big, but very much worth saving. And they, they didn't cut those. The logging company sued. They actually successfully sued for over a million dollars because they didn't get to cut down those cedars because they would have made so much money. And they uh, it, and it was interesting because the, the district tried to rely on uh, the uh, public interest clause. This is we can stop logging if it's in the public interest. At the law, at the court case, you know, which went before the Supreme Court and then the Court of Appeal, the judges pointed out. The board actually speaks for the public interest, and they actually voted to go ahead with it. That that was the meeting where Jack Monroe slammed his fist down and insisted that they support the loggers by voting yes. And they actually used that meeting to justify to say that when the staff afterwards stopped logging, they they weren't acting. They weren't the speaking. They weren't speaking for the public interest. It's the board who spoke for the public interest, and since the board already approved it, they had a right to cut it. And so there, there was a lawsuit for a million. Those trees are st still standing, but they, they paid a big price for that. The only good thing that ever came out of that was that they didn't, from that point on, they did not approve any more logging. And they started a process for reviewing what they're going to do from here. There was no more cut block. Well, there was one cut block that was approved that was, um, it was supposed to be selective logging. And uh, it was going to be helicopter logging. They did start that, but the helicopter crashed, almost start, went on fire, and it was such a fiasco. That's that was the last cut in the in the watersheds. And that was early 1995. Um, then something happened later in 1995. There was a big slide that happened in the Capilano Reservoir, and it was a bad one. And it was one you could see from the if you take the sky ride up to uh Gross Mountain. You could see it from there and it fouled up the water and it was it was serious and it made it on the news. Now, John Morris, who's a chief engineer, went on the news and he says, it's nowhere near logging. This has nothing to do lo with logging. Uh, there's no, no, it's not near any logging roads. Now, by that time, uh, Will Coop was our, our person on the ground, our field activists who would go into the watershed on a regular basis and take photos. And I don't hope he doesn't mind me saying that, but he did. In fact, he got caught and, but he was, he had, he brought the photos out. And of course the district wanted to ban him from ever uh, going near the watershed again. Their focus was that uh, he trespassed, but the pictures he brought out were the videos. powerful. 
and the videos. But one of the other things he brought out was he 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 went in there and he studied that slide that was fouled and fouled up the water, and he could he showed in a video and through pictures that it was directly triggered by a culvert on the logging road. In other words, there's this logging road. They, they create these culverts. The waters get concentrated on the culvert, something which Western Canada wilderness community has been saying for years, and it destabilizes the slope. So he followed the drainage of the culvert and it went right to the top of the slide, which is exactly what you would expect. You concentrate the flows, there's extra water, and there's this water pounding down the slope where it wouldn't normally. And it destable, it supersaturates the soil, and it, it leaves it ripe for uh, for a slide. Now, John Morris had, had gone on TV saying that it was nowhere near a logging road. Will went in and found it was directly below a logging road. So who's telling the truth? Well, Will had the pictures, and there was this meeting that um, we had. It was set. It was in November of 1995, and we went back to the Water Committee. And by that time, we had built up a lot of credibility. And that was a that was a watershed moment that meeting, because they also were hearing from some experts that were hired to explain it. And those experts say they had nothing to do with the logging room. Well, first of all, Bob Cavill had to explain their map that showed that it was nowhere near logging roads. There was a mapping error, so he explained that there was a mapping error, and yes, it is actually below a logging room. So he he explained he they swapped maps under the agenda. Their first map showed it as being away from the logging roads. They, he came in at that meeting and presented another map that showed it completely below the logging room, but then argued that you had the um, engineers say that, oh, but it would have happened anyway. And it's not, we don't believe it's directed, directly related. However, the remediation is to divert that culvert. Well, if the culvert had nothing to do with it, why is the main remediation diverting the culvert? So it was completely inconsistent as most of what came out of the GVRD was completely inconsistent. After that presentation by the engineer, it, 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 the, the watershed moment was, this is a water committee. Len Trombley was sitting there and others. And Len said, turn to the engineers. And he looks that, looked them in the eye and he says, I've been following this issue for a long time. And I've seen a lot of reports and I've seen, I've read your report now. And I don't believe you. Len Trouble looked the engineers in the eye and said, I don't believe you. And I said, I don't believe you for a moment that these are unconnected. And then Pam Lewin, who was a Surrey counselor, who was very, very well respected. And, and she said, it's a sad state of affairs when I, as uh, as a council, as a, as a board member on the, uh, for the GVRD on the, We'll get better information from Mr. Hundle and Mr. Coop, and, and as, I'm sure he, he would have included Ms. Goals in this, but I get better information from Mr. Hundle than I do from my own staff. She said that right to their face. That was and, great. It was great. <laughs> yeah. Well, is that you speaking? That was a great moment. And um, we knew at that point we'd won. And uh, so then afterwards they set up an ecological inventory and the ecological inventory was designed to bring in scientists experts to uh, guide the process and to come up with a what should we be doing for the watersheds politically they there was no appetite for it at all by 19 but staff were still saying their double talk saying they had the experts on their side now, there's one thing that came out of that ecological inventory process, which I think it was really enlightening. And then that the sense, what it, what came really clear is that when these foresters come up with these concepts, their models, they came up in the ecological inventory, they came up with all these models. Models are nothing more than hypotheses. Hypotheses, sorry. And a model needs to be tested and if it tests out, it will be experimentation, repeated. If it's proved out through that experience, through uh, experiments, then it becomes science. It's not science until it's tested and proven. But in amongst the foresters and among the forest side, uh, the industry uh, based forest, foreign uh, forest, forest consultants, they 
really presented a bunch of models that were not proven. I realized when I was going through that process, this is what's been happening all along. When they approved the abandoning indenture back in 1967, they said they would have the experts on their side. They didn't have science on their side. There had been never any actual proven science to say that logging will improve water quality in the on the coast range here. They just had their models that they'd come up with that replacing old decadent forests with young thrifty trees will improve water quality. That's their model. They're sticking to it. And they're experts. And because they're experts, we're going to believe them. Everything pre produced in the ecological inventory were more models. There was no actual proof. Now, in that process, we brought in our own scientists. Well, we brought in this, the uh, Doug Larson from um, Oregon was a person whose CV went on for pages. And he provided great information to counter what was being said. Uh, brought in this uh, person who literally wrote the textbook on more, uh, geomorphology. And at the meeting where they had the GVRD panel scientists, or not scientists, they're experts lined up at a at a meeting. Uh, the, uh, the professor said that if I if my students handed this in, I would have failed it. He said, and, he, and then he completely denounced the the logic of it. So he denounced the results of the ecological inventory. We had uh, experts like Doug Larson. We had um, Dr. Feller, Dr. Michael Feller, who rest in peace. He died recently, but he was a very committed person to conservation, a, a person I dearly loved. He presented the forest science. He he rebutted the forest science around uh, forest fires that was being presented to say it might help forest fires. And he was pointing out that the young stands would actually be more of a fire risk. You log and you have more of a chance of forest fires than the old growth. And uh, so at the end of the day, I, I recall one of the uh, newspaper uh, journalists uh, who came up to me and he says, you know, I've heard both sides. I've seen their scientists and your sides, and I've checked out the credentials on your guys. And your your fellow, your, the people supporting you have way better credentials than the experts who were sitting up front in the panel. They were hired by the GVRD to give them advice. There was one comic moment with the Western Canada Wilderness Committee um, are great entertainers as well. And there was one fellow, an actor by the name of Robert Light, who was an amazing guy. And he dressed up, he interrupted the meeting where all the experts were of the GVRD were there. And he was dressed as Darth Vader. And he went down and he to the mic and he says, I bow to you. You have succeeded in achieving a level of evil that even I admire. And it had everyone broken up. And uh, and he referred to them as the $6 million man. And he did that because they paid them $6 million for this report. And it was a report which continued the risk usual rationale for logging but it was it did back off somewhat it said there may be no there may not be an economic value in it that they ended up kind of giving the politicians a way out to say well we still believe that it improves water quality but there might not be an economic case for it and uh so the politicians at the end of that inventory process um were satisfied that it was not uh, appropriate to continue logging. Now, at that point, again, all along, I, as a lawyer, I had been looking for the way to fight this battle legally because that's the way you win battles. And uh, Will made a mention about my other battles that I fought. And every there was three main major battles and other many other minor ones. And every single battle I fought to save forests, which I'd won, um, it was always following the legal processes available. I never supported road blockades and violating injunctions. I'm a lawyer. I'm not allowed to violate injunctions, and I never did. And uh, the time I went into the watershed, I was, I just walked away from a tour. But that's the closest I ever I got to uh, 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 being questionable in that say. But I, I, I always looked for the where to go in the process when I fought to say. Uh, the uh, stop the subdivision from going in and in um, Seymour Valley and Lynn Canyon Park. Um, it was at the OCP level. 
And I found a trust document that some of the land that was set aside is that was given to them as park land, but was being slated for development because they never actually made it into a park. I found the trust documents in an archive that showed that it was sold to them on on the transfer to them on the condition that they set it aside as park and never subdivide it. So by Cleveland. Yeah. And so we followed the legal process there uh, to fight the save the old growth up at Cyprus, which they were trying to turn into a golf course. Again, we followed the legal process. Nobody had to bust and break injunctions or do that. We had to appear before council and argue our case. And in that case, I found a technicality that forced them to have a referendum. So then we were able to plead our case to the public and we won 58%. And it would save the old growth from being turned into a golf course. And it's now the old growth conservancy. This battle, I had been from day one, I was looking, how do we stop this for good? And the, there was a way, and that was something that I had been saying to them since day one, cancel the amending indenture. The amending indenture has in it a two-year cancellation clause, but the council has to vote to cancel the amending indenture. And then two years later, they'll no longer have a requirement to log. And from day one, that was my objective, cancel the amending indenture. Because as long as that amending indenture was there, they were required by law to log. That indenture, they voted to cancel that indenture uh, on June 21st, 2002. That's when we won. And it went into effect June 30th, 2004. The, event, the amending indenture that Ray Williston built, brought in to undo Cleveland's legacy was no more. And so the uh, require, requirement to log was no more. And there was instead a, a restriction on logging under the original indenture. So that's what saved at the end of the day, finally brought an end uh, in every way to the logging. And But it took everybody's work, Will, Elaine. Uh, you know, we each brought in our strengths. Elaine was the scientist who could peer review any report that came up and gave us good advice. And Will was the researcher who got the photos in the woods that made the huge difference because it, it brought the truth to the public because the public wasn't getting the truth they, they were they were saying nothing they were yeah well they would say they were lying and i'm not going to call them liars because they can get sued for that defamation but they weren't being forthright with the facts and it was will who brought the truth to the the board the people who were empowered to make the decisions and uh and my role was as a lawyer to to advocate and put it all together and to find a legal route to end it, which we did. Hey, Paul. So that's the battle. Hey, Paul. And how it was won. Yes? Um, that day, uh, I went to the Water Committee meeting where they passed the 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 resolution to cancel the amending indenture. And when I left the building, got into my car, I was driving down Kingsway, I opened the window and shout it out as loud as I could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was also great to see the political process at work. You know, when seeing someone like George Puel, who was a, a, you know, I developed a lot of respect for George. He became the chair of the committee, or sorry, the chair of the, of the board of the GVRD by the time it was canceled for good. And, you know, people would judge him for being, you know, on the right side of things, but, on the right wing side of things, but he uh, he was definitely a thinking person. He thought for himself and he was persuaded. But the we also saw the bad side of things because at one point there was a critical uh, vote, but it was a vote we know we had won. It, it was it was um, it was closely uh, it was linked to the amending indenture. And and what had happened is Western Canada Wilderness Committee organized a, a protest. And the protest moved into the boardroom and it disrupted the boardroom. And it disrupted it big time. I've never seen George Peel so mad. He was chair of the board. He 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 shut it down, the meeting down. He went out and he was furious. He literally pushed protesters out. I was worried about him getting charged with assault because he was getting just losing it. And you know, we we could have lost a lot of political capital that day because. The people like George were never going to be bullied and intimidated or pushed by protests to vote a certain way. 
And it was only because of the work we had done on the years before that completely satisfied him that it was right, that he voted to stop the logging and to cancel the indenture. It, the protests were very counterproductive. I saw it at, in action at that day. It was it was embarrassing. I we never asked for it. We'd already know we knew that we had won the vote, that we had the vote. I knew all the politicians by then. We, we I talked to them constantly. We knew we had it. They didn't have to orchestrate that protest. And um, but it did give me a chance to see the downside of certain types of protesting. And and there's so many people who just automatically go to that route. You know, for instance, uh, Eagle Ridge, when there were people who were fighting the highway, I was at the meetings and involved in the protest, or sorry, involved in op opposing it. But when it was first, they were seeking approval. I was the only one there. And I would make my pitch to say, this shouldn't go ahead because, and I give all my reasons, but I was the only one there. And it was only after the, the highway was approved through Eagle Ridge that you had hundreds of protesters getting arrested. And I was there. I, I, I'd done my part, and it was too late. Once it was, the approvals were in, there was nothing else I could do. And But I just looked at all those people. Why weren't those people there when it was being coming, going before the public bodies for approval? Um, and it's just too bad that too many battles are fought that way, where people sit and do nothing until the approvals are in, until the, the law basically is locked down so that people have a right to cut those trees or do what they want. And then they people come in and protest and try to block road, uh, highways and get arrested. And, you know, it, it may have worked in Clayoquot Sound, but there's not many other places where I think it really has worked. And, and it's too bad that that's kind of the go-to way of uh, fighting these battles. Uh, I strongly recommend against it. And then one last thing I'll say, in dealing with the media, one... I learned a lot about dealing with the media and they were a key part of it. There were so many articles about this issue and, and, it, and it, it would show both sides because I learned one thing about dealing with the media. First of all, I, I developed a very high opinion of journalists. Uh, you know, they're really smart people. And so I learned also that they have a tight deadlines and they don't have any time to do stories. And knowing all those facts, the way I approached the media and which I recommend everybody to is get to know what the other side is saying, everything the other side is saying. So when then when you talk to the journalist, you tell them your side of the story, but then you tell them everything the other side's going to say. Then you give them the name of the person who's the point person who's authorized to speak, and then you you give them their phone number. So in the watershed battle, Bob Cavill was the the media person who was speaking on behalf of the GVRD. I would talk to Bob all the time and find out exactly what he was going to say. I would go to the journalist. I would say, our position is this. Now, if you phone Bob, here's his phone number. He's going to tell you A, B, and C. The journalist, you can be sure, I wasn't there, but I can be sure, he phoned up Bob the next minute, right after he got off the phone with me, and Bob would have said A, B, and C. The journalist has a story because he not only has the A, B, and C verified that I told him Bob would say, and Bob says it, but he also has my response. He doesn't have to come back to me for it. I've already told him my side of the story, and I've said their story, and I've said why it's wrong. And next thing you know, you're reading about it in the newspaper. Nowadays, it's not in the newspaper anywhere, but back in the 90s, that's what the success to get it in the newspaper. And, and so I learned that's the way to... Um, really help the journalists get the story right. And it's knowing the other sides, what they're going to say, and giving the journalists their phone number and, and telling them exactly. So I urge people to keep that in mind if you're doing, if you're trying to fight your own battles here, if, uh, if you need to work with the media. That's when we used to have newspapers. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I guess it's a very different world now. With, but there still is journalism out there. It's, it's a television, TV journalism, and the same thing applies to TV. I was on TV a number of times, and Will, you, you were too. I'm pretty sure. And um, it's it quite a number, yeah. as well. So you give them the, your story; they'll take some uh, 
take a video of you, and then you tell them what the other side's going to say, and so they can go to them. And when they find out that the guy, that the person you've sent them to, does say what you've said they would say, that boosts your credibility. I would always look. They they loved me for because I could tell them the whole story, and they knew they could rely on that, and they could go and verify it. And it helps them, and it'll help you build your own credibility. It people who go there and try to tell the half the story and not the whole story, they're not going to have a lot of credibility necessarily. They may over time, but that if you do it the other way, you'll um, you'll be respected by the media as a source. It to reminds of all those stories. Um, but one thing that still makes me angry when every time I think about it, you know, are the proposals to log within spotted owl habitat. Oh, that was an outrage what they did. You know, there was a there was a discovery of a spotted owl up in Sheba Creek, uh, which is in the Seymour drainage. They went ahead and cut. They went ahead and cut. Now, this is before we had become involved. It was in the end of the 80s. But we heard the story from someone and um, that they went ahead and cut in the Sheba after um, someone had said that they had they had a, a whistle of some sort which would attract uh, spotted owls and that they they went up there to test it out and they got a response. And the GVRD is told, thank you very much, shuffled them away, and they went ahead with the cut. And who, that who was, who was that bi spotted owl biologist? I forgot his name. Um, but you recall the story, Will? Well, yeah. Even Ed Hamaguchi said yeah. that he took pictures of spotted owls. Yeah. But that didn't stop them at all. They, you know, it was really that Jack, Jack Monroe just said it more bluntly when he said, I tell my the loggers, if you see a spotted owl, shoot it. Well, the foresters practically do the same thing. They just continue to approve cut blocks in areas with spotted owls and and it didn't make any difference. And that's why it's uh, extirpated from this region. Uh, and, you know, there's another, well, I was saying about the models. This issue is going to come up again now with the uh, uh, the logging that's supposed to be wildfire treatments. They're trying to bring wildfire fire treatments to the coast, to this region. And it too is based on modeling. It's not based on science. They're trying to start logging. They are logging now up, up Hollybur Mountain. I'm trying to stop it. Uh, but the expert is saying we need to do it. And it'll fire, you know, well, they don't use the word fireproof because that would get them in trouble. They can't fireproof it. But the the, the staff are saying it's fireproof. They lead people to believe that they're protecting us from fire, that they can stop the fire if we if we just do this logging. And it's all based on models. It's not based on actual science that's proven. I took Michael Feller up to the first proposed site and you know he said there is no proven, there's nothing proving that this model works on the coast. The models, that, I mean, the, the proof that does exist, which comes from the states, is in for drier forests, which they say supports it. Um, but it applies to places like Kelowna and applies to the interior. In fact, it applies to most of BC, which has drier forests. And it says, it's saying that because of suppression of fire over the decades, uh, there's been an uncharacteristic fuel buildup. And that fuel buildup is increasing the intensity of fire. Therefore, we need to reduce the fuels. And that's why they bring in these fuel reduction programs. But that doesn't apply to the coast because first of all, wildfire isn't a natural part of the process. And the, in the interior, wildfire is the way the stand replaces itself. And look, on the coast, it's gap regeneration. The fires are so scarce, they, oh, the return rate was estimated to be 350 years. And now they're saying because of climate change, it's down to 200 years. And it, and so, but they're trying to apply it to the coast, even though there's no uncharacteristic buildup of fuel on Hollyburn Mountain, the places where they're authorizing it. There's no buildup, not unnatural buildup. The, the, the science that says this may help is applying to areas where there's a, a buildup of fuel that's unnatural through years of suppression. And so uh, the models are being misapplied here. And so we're back to where we were and they could, this likely will be an excuse to go back into logging in the watershed to reduce the wildfire. wildfire. And they'll, they'll, again, it'll be based on the same kind of models 
that that started logging to improve water quality. And in other words, nothing proven. And and I'm really concerned about that that is getting traction mostly because people are so afraid of fire that uh, that the public, it's going to be hard to win them. It was easy to win the public when your water is coming out of the tap brown. It's going to be a completely different story to try to persuade people that this isn't really protecting you from wildfire. It's just an excuse to log. <laughs>